Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Today we are delighted to welcome Professor Paul Fletcher, Co-Director of Cambridge Neuroscience, who will launch this series by giving us an overview of some of the many recent publications on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. Paul is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of Cambridge and asks the question, is the COVID-19 pandemic really causing mental illness? Enjoy. And the question I've posed here is was initially intended to be slightly mischievous because, of course, it's stupid. Of, co of course, COVID-19 pandemic is causing mental illness. And in many interesting, surprising, distressing ways. But at the same time, it's also far from clear cut what the nature of that is. And in many instances, as I'll argue, I think um, we may be jumping to conclusions somewhat. Um, it's a question that's clearly exercised the uh, research community as a whole. And certainly if there isn't a tsunami of uh, mental illness caused by COVID-19, there's certainly a tsunami of papers claiming that there's a tsunami of mental illness. Um, and what I'd like to, or the task I set myself in, in preparing this talk was to try and make sense of the overall pattern, to, to make sense of the nature of this tsunami um, or in, in one case uh, from a group of investigators who decided to depart from, uh, or to, to use a slightly different language, but not to depart from the aquatic metaphor, a crashing wave of mental illness. Um, and I found it very valuable and interesting, uh, but, but, but also quite complicated and, and difficult enterprise. And it's taken up a lot of my time. And I should issue a couple of disclaimers at the outset. Um, First, this is not a systematic review of the field. It, it's a literature that's changing very, very fast. Um, and also, this is the first in a series of talks. And there's some, there's some uh, topics here that I'll cover that I think will be covered in much greater detail and with greater nuance by forthcoming talks from uh, people like Tanzin Ford, Carol Brain, Rudolf Cardinal, and, and David Menon. Um, um, and one, one other important, it's not really a disclaimer, but it's a sort of forewarning, and that is that I think the area draws us into quite contentious territory. And at times I get a sense that what the emerging picture of research into th this field is telling us is that people in general are responding to a stressful and worrying situation become, by becoming stressed and worried. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, all good. Um, so I, I'm not I'm not sure what was muted and what wasn't, but I don't think it matters too much. I'll just press on. So uh, essentially, the overview of my talk is I want to begin by thinking about the predictions that we might make. What might we expect in terms of mental illness based upon what we already know about past coronavirus pandemics and infections more generally? And then moving on to the actual reality of what's confronted us in the last few months. And this will begin with a short quite anecdotal digression on some of the less predictable experiences of psychiatry in the COVID pandemic, and then moving on to the reality of the actual emerging evidence, um, what patterns have emerged over the course in terms of both the infection itself in the acute and the, the, the post-infective stages, and also the general context, what, what has been the effect on the general population and on clinical populations of the lockdown situations. And finally, to conclude, I, I just want to think about what, what broad um, patterns we're seeing in terms of the impact of the infection in these different phases, and also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic as a whole on the vulnerable and the general population. And, and finally, a consideration of this point I was trying to make that um, and the language, the application of the rhetoric or the language of mental health and mental illness, is, is it um, always applicable in, in this uh, situation? So this is the sort of broad structure of my talk. Um, 
I'm not sure if you can see the arrow, but this point in the bottom left hand corner about examining the, pre the effects of pre-existing psychiatric illness, gender, age, social factors on each of the different um, factors that I'll consider. I'm doing that in a very informal way. I, I'll, I'll be raising some points, particularly the ones that seem to be consistent across studies, but I, I won't actually be formally addressing it. So a quick um, digression on the practicalities of psychiatry dur during the, the pandemic. And I'm thinking particularly about the, the phase of um, really quite intense lockdown uh, in the months after March of this year. So like all clinicians and allied professions across the different specialities, my colleagues at the uh, Cambridge and Peterborough Foundation Mental Health Trust had really faced some, some quite extraordinary difficulties in responding to some new ways of practicing their, practicing their trade. I don't want to go into this in much detail, except to say that I, I, I couldn't bypass this opportunity to public not, publicly acknowledge that their responses as individuals and as a collective to these challenges was just so impressive to me. Um, I was very honoured to work alongside colleagues in the Addenbrooke's liaison psychiatry team from March until August and just was repeatedly uh, struck and bowled over by the energy and flexibility, teamwork and, and complete dogged commitment to these very trying circumstances. And of course, it wasn't just the, the professionals who were, um, who were facing this, you know, one has to bear witness to uh, the impact of the whole situa situation on very vulnerable um, people, often facing extremely harrowing circumstances. And there are so many instances that spring to mind um, that one could witness, one could bear witness to, that a young single mother in a state of really severe anxiety because she was taking her baby home to an empty house with no contact allowed with her parents and relatives, or with friends or with the sorts of community support that can be really crucial in the early and the, the very exhausting stages of parenthood. Or there was the woman who was stuck in isolation with an abusive partner who had no way to turn uh, because of this situation. Or another man who in his forties was, was diagnosed with, newly diagnosed with an intracerebral tumor who was 50 miles from home and hadn't seen his wife or young daughter in five weeks, except over his iPad. Or a man who was in complete isolation and finding that the voices and the delusions that plagued him were becoming ever more severe to the extent that he eventually made a, a very, very serious suicide attempt. Or one young man who, who um, will stay with me, who was on ICU and was convinced that he was in danger of abduction and persecution by extraterrestrials and who became extremely distressed and genuinely terrified when I went to see him because I was dressed like colleagues in a way that uh, is guaranteed to distress such people. So, so there's an awful lot behind the data that one has to bear in mind of individual, individual stories of, of, of being impacted in different and very powerful ways by the pandemic. And I really wanted to, to set that up as a context for moving on to the, the literature itself. So let's think about the predictions, what we would expect um, based upon what we already know. Um, so there's a very good paper came out uh, not long after um, lockdown from Rogers and colleagues in which they systematically reviewed and analyzed um, the impact of two very noteworthy coronavirus outbreaks, the SARS from 2002 and the, the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome from 2012. And what they, what they found was that in the acute stages, confusion, depressed mood, anxiety, insomnia were major parts of the presentation of these um, viral illnesses. And in the longer term, what we were seeing was high incidence of fatigue, depressed mood, anxiety, memory problems, sleep disturbance, and in, in many cases, um, actual um, diagnostic or reaching diagnostic criteria for anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in, in the more chronic stages. So clearly the coronavirus has a history of causing or being a, a, 
presenting in terms of symptoms of mental illness and of potentially causing mental illness. And this itself is perhaps not surprising given a, an often, I think, forgotten uh, piece of work by uh, ben Ross and colleagues published in 2013, in which they carefully examined the risk for first lifetime diagnosis of a mood disorder following infection. And they showed that prior hospital contact for an immune disease, autoimmune disease, or, for or hospitalization for infection hugely increased the risk of mood disorders by 45% in the case of autoimmune disease, by 62% in the case of um, uh, a hospitalization for an infection. Now, these, these figures are, you know, against a low baseline, but they're still compared to what the classic textbook risk factors for mood disorders are, things like uh, death of a parent before the age of 10 or divorce and things like that. Um, th these are very big. And it's important to remember that, that having an infection is a major risk for subsequent diagnosis of mental illness. Uh, and there seem to be, in, the, in their case, a dose-response relationship. So summarizing what our predictions would be is that infections generally and autoimmune responses and possibly coronavirus in particular appreciably in increases the risk of mood disorders. So, so what's the reality? And thinking first about the, um, the uh, acute stages of the infection. So the, a clue comes from this rather nice uh, review by a liaison psychiatry team of 50 cases. This was, this was based in, um, in Doha, Qatar, in which all patients had had a positive antigen test for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, some were currently symptomatic for, for the COVID-19. And there was a huge uh, prevalence of psychiatrically related symptoms, uh, sleep disturbance, anxiety, agitation, depressed mood, irritability. You, you can see the figures there. And psychosis and mania, including in those people who'd not had uh, a previous history of psychiatric illness, were also quite striking. So presentation uh, to the psychiatrist when in COVID-19 is, is uh, a fairly common occurrence. Me and colleagues uh, did a, a single center cross-sectional study of 78 patients with all, again, with confirmed COVID-19. This is between February and March. And they gave them self ratings of anxiety and depression. Uh, they used the Zung scales, which I'll come to in a second. And they found, again, a high incidence of depression, 36%, and anxiety, 39%. And these were more likely in females, in those who'd had family members who currently had COVID or in those who had family members who died from COVID. Um, again, prevalence of depression from this study by, by Maratal. This again was an online study that they administered to a total of 770 patients who were currently in patients across five hospitals in the Hubei province in China. And they, they, uh, were, they administered the online um, PHQ-9, the so-called Patient Health Questionnaire nine-item study, which screens for depression. And they found 43% of people met the clinical cutoff for depression. So again, we're seeing a really pronounced presentation in psychiatric terms. And I don't want to go into details in this study. Anyone who wants these references, of course, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to send my slides. Um, it shows that Para and, and colleagues showed that looking at all patients presenting to emergency departments and liaison psychiatrists, this was between March and April in Madrid, um, uh, a number of new onset psychotic symptoms in confirmed COVID, a total of 10 patients. Uh, I can't remember what the denominator was, but uh, this often presented as an initial confusional state, but then the emergence of a structured delusional system with delusions of reference. Um, I wanted to very briefly touch on related presentation in the acute phase, and this is the so-called neurological presentation. Uh, so Mao and colleagues published an early study based on uh, case studies from three hospitals in Wuhan province, um, 
or in Wuhan, uh, they had 214 confirmed cases of infection and 36% had neurological symptoms. And these varied from sort of central nervous system impaired consciousness, dizziness, ataxia, to more peripheral nerve problems, the classic, what's become the, the well-recognized agusia and anosmia, that is not, not being able to taste or smell. Um, and a subsequent review of patients referred to a, a multidisciplinary team at the National Hospital for Neurology in Queen Square also showed a, a fair number of patients presenting with neurological deficits, including encephalopathy, strokes, peripheral nerve damage, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. I, I don't want to go into the details. I just want to make the point that a neurological presentation is, has been um, marked right from the outset. And there's a very good couple of papers actually um, led by David Menon in both cases. Uh, and David, I think, will be speaking either next week or the week after. So I, I definitely recommend uh, listening to him. But um, they reviewed the neurological implications of COVID-19 and have produced what I think is the first MRI scanning study of patients with COVID-19. So to, to summarize that particular bit, that, that is the acute presentation of, or, or the, the presentation of psychiatric symptoms and neuropsychiatric symptoms in the context of the infection. Uh, leaving aside the neurology, because I, I don't want to go into that, there is clear evidence for the occurrence of psychiatric symptoms during the acute phase of COVID-19, notably anxiety, depressed mood, irritability, some more uh, severe presentations with mania and psychosis when somebody gets hallucinations and delusions. And the risk seems to be increased in females and those with social stresses. But at the same time, I think at this point, we're, we're confronted with the glimmerings of a, of a difficulty, which is um, partly that the diagnosis of mental illness per se specifically entails ruling out the presence of a known pathology that could explain symptoms. So the symptoms that we're talking about, these anxiety, depression, irritability, confusion, and so forth, they're ambiguous in many ways um, because they could arise directly out of the infective cause. And in some cases, to add to that ambiguity, I think the scales that are being used in these studies, notably the um, PHQ-9 and the Zung depression and anxiety scales, these are self-report scales and they're online and it's worth looking at them because you can actually score as moderately depressed on the PHQ-9 scale if you assent to having sleep, eating and concentration difficulties. Now, I don't know if you spend any time in hospital feeling ill, but having sleep, eating and concentration difficulties can be a major part of that. And to assume that one is depressed because one exhibits those features is to jump to a conclusion, I think. Sorry. And also the zone depression uh, rating scale. This asks questions about trouble sleeping, low energy, being worried, having a reduced appetite, weight loss, feeling tired, constipation, not being able to do the things you enjoy. You ask any patient in a hospital questions of that type, and it's likely that they'll score quite high. Similarly, their anxiety scale alludes to breathing difficulties, headaches, feeling weak and tired, worried, sleep disturbances, feeling hot, having stomach aches. Now, under some circumstances, these, these may well signify an anxiety syndrome, but in the context of a COVID-19 infection uh, as an inpatient, they must surely be ambiguous. And I'm gonna to return to that, but let's think now about the post-infection stage, which is getting a, a lot of um, a lot of uh, attention. So, this study by Lu and others uh, examines was a meta-analysis of sixty-two studies, uh, summing to one hundred and six, nearly one hundred and sixty-three thousand participants from seventeen countries, and lasting up until May of this year. And they found a high prevalence. This is post-COVID now, this, this is, um, well, some of these were post-COVID, I, I, I'll come to this in a moment, but a high prevalence generally in the population outside the hospital of anxiety and depression. But this was highest amongst people who'd had COVID-19. So this may be considered 
a, a glimpse of anxiety and depression emerging in the longer term, having had the infection. Again, we see this being highest in women. It was also higher in nurses, people with lower socioeconomic status, people who are socially isolated, and particularly high in certain countries. Um, Marzer and others uh, assessed 402 COVID survivors uh, between April and June. 300 of them had been admitted for severe pneumonia, 102 had been managed at home, and they were assessed 30 days after discharge or 30 days after their initial ass assessment. So they might be considered to be recovered from the infection. But actually, um, across a number of scales, looking at PTSD, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, insomnia, 56% scored in the pathological range. This was ostensibly when they were recovered. And you can, you can see the breakdown of the figures there, PTSD, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive, uh, disorders. This again was worse in women and worse with, in those with a psychiatric history and in fact a quarter of those patients had had a psychiatric history. Uh, the point is in a group who were ostensibly recovered we're seeing elements of a, a, a psychiatric syndrome emerging. Um, this work by Lee and Wang, this actually capitalized on a, a study that's been run over several years uh, in the UK, the um, UK Household Longitudinal Study, which happens to acquire data on the so-called general health questionnaire, 12 item scale measuring depression. And, and they capitalized on this by looking at uh, a wave of data collection that occurred during the lockdown in late April. In this case, 29% of respondents scored sufficiently highly on the GHQ-12 to be considered a case for depression. So being above four would be considered mild depression. Again, this was worse in women. It was worse in younger people. It was worse in those with a history of a COVID infection. Um, so suggesting again that to some extent this might be driven by uh, as, as a sort of more chronic prelude to the infection. And it was worse in the unemployed. Um, I'm, I'm rushing through these a bit. I'm just trying to give you a sense and then I'll summarize it. Um, Chen and colleagues assessed uh, all COVID-19 patients from 12 hospitals across the Wenzhou um, province, uh, one month after discharge. So again, ostensibly recovered and they assessed them using quality of life questionnaire and a so-called short form 36 questionnaire, which gives a, a sort of, um, variety of measures of physical and mental health. Now, the interesting thing about this study is that actually on, on scores of general health, vitality and mental health factors, post-COVID patients compared to the population norm seem to score better uh, as though they'd somehow benefited from their experience. So this is a, this is a sort of um, a bit of a blip in an otherwise rather pessimistic picture. I think this study is is really the, one of the most impressive. This is uh, this is only available as a preprint on Med Archive, but uh, I suspect it'll be out there in the literature soon. So this was uh, from the Oxford group, led by Paul Harrison and first author is Maxime Taquet, and this looked at electronic health records from a total of sixty nine million people using the TriNetX analytics network, which covers. Um, 54 healthcare organizations across the USA. And they looked at the primary outcome of the incidence of first psychiatric diagnosis over a period of a, a 14 to 90 day period after diagnosis of COVID-19. And they had a total of 62,000 uh, people who'd had a diagnosis. And of those 44,000 of nearly 45,000 had no previous psychiatric history. And what they found was that the COVID-19 diagnosis was associated with an increased risk of psychiatric diagnosis of multiple types, most notably anxiety and depression, compared to lots of other physical illnesses. So compared to influenza, it had a hazard ratio of 2.1, compared to respiratory infection, skin infection, uh, treatment for gallstones, treatment for kidney stones. So 
whatever it is, COVID-19 infection seems to be having a more deleterious effect on mental health compared to a whole tranche of other phys- fairly severe physical um, problems requiring hospitalization. They also noted that um, psychiatric diagnosis in the previous year, prior to COVID-19, was, associate, or was associated with a 60%, uh, 65% higher risk of actually getting COVID-19. So this is what they're alluding to in the title of their paper about bidirectional associations. So having COVID-19 seemed to be very bad for your mental health, but having poor mental health seemed to uh, predispose you to COVID-19. Interestingly, there was overall uh, a general 30% reduction in psychiatric diagnoses across the population as a whole. And they they put this down to um, people not presenting uh, to their psychiatrists or to the doctors. One further comment on the more chronic effects of COVID-19, and this is what's really in the news at the moment, the idea of long COVID. Um, This is a as far as I can tell, first brought to attention by this paper from Carthy and others who uh, published in JAMA in August, um, persistent symptoms in patients after acute COVID-19. They collected data from 21st of April to the end of May, and all individuals had been discharged, having been diagnosed with COVID, and had had subsequently two negative tests. So they they could be considered now to be in the post COVID stage. And yet 87% of them still had symptoms. And you can see the, um, on the right of this graph here, that the the relative uh, percentage of symptoms such as fatigue, uh, breathlessness, continued pains, coughs, loss of sense of smell and so forth. Um, It was a clear indication published in August then that uh, despite having negative tests and despite being well enough to be home, there was a lingering effect of the infection. And some of it was uh, appearing in the context of more uh, psychological symptoms, if you if you like. And this was also alluded to in a paper that's also available as a preprint by Wilding and Holt. Uh, And they refer to this quote, less devastating symptoms such as fatigue and myalgia. These so-called lesser symptoms appear to be emerging as a longer term for some, su- as a long, sorry, as longer term for some sufferers and have been recently labeled as long COVID. And they drew some parallels between them and things like um, chronic fatigue syndromes and functional neurological disorders. I just wanted to raise this point um, but to summarise this question of, you know, what are the post-infective, what are the more chronic effects of COVID-19 on, on mental health? I think there's a clear indication uh, that following recovery from the infection, there are two potentially worrying clinical uh, pictures emerging. One is an, a very much heightened risk of anxiety and depression, plus potentially things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and other less specific phenomena like insomnia or sleeping difficulties. And and these come with clear risk factors, particularly people who've had more severe COVID infection, people who have pre-existing psychiatric conditions, women, and people who are vulnerable to social stressors or who are experiencing social stressors. And then the second thing is this, which may be related to this, is this question of long COVID, this fatigue, malaise, persistent physical, mental and cognitive symptoms. Now, I I think there are a couple of points worth raising about this before moving on. So given the work I've cited previously about what we might know about um, the impact of infections and particularly coronavirus infections on mental health, what we're seeing is not altogether unexpected in people who have been hospitalized or due to infection or who have been ill with infection. But it does seem to be relatively severe and more prevalent compared to the SARS, to, uh, the previous MERS and SARS uh, pandemics. Again, I, I should emphasize this point that a number of studies that I've just cited have used these scales, the GHQ12 measuring depression, the PHQ9 again measuring depression, the GAD 
7, that general ang anxiety disorder 7. And, and I, I, I think these are useful screening tools, but I think that the conclusions may be being drawn more firmly than are warranted by these scales. Because as I say, you can score high for depression and anxiety on these scales with some pretty non-specific symptoms, insomnia, weakness, worry, feeling tired. Um, and in, in fact, one study that used a different approach used this so-called short form 36 questionnaire actually found improvements in mental health. So we need to bear that in mind as, as uh, a sort of, you know, rather than drawing over firm conclusions at the moment. Nevertheless, overall, I think that this TACA study that's available as preprint now really clinches this important bi-directional link between psychiatric diagnosis and COVID-19. So now moving on to the context, um, I think you know one, one could break down the contextual effects of the lockdown and everything that goes with it and the effect on services in many ways. I, I've chosen just to do it in this way, to firstly consider the impact it has on service demand and service provision. Now I've already alluded in, in some of the anecdotes uh, I mentioned earlier, the impact that it might have on how we at the at the sort of clinical um, face are providing services with all the problems with PPE or online consultations with patients. But it seems to be that there have been marked changes in how people are actually approaching or using the services. And I, I mentioned in this TACA study, the 30% reduction in psychiatric diagnoses in the total electronic health record population that, um, that they studied across the 54 healthcare uh, providers in the US. There's also another study published quite recently, uh, earlier this month by Richard Williams in The Lancet Public Health. Um, and this was a retrospective cohort study carried out between January and May of this year. And they looked at records from 47 GPs in Salford. And Across 240,000 people, about 49% women, they found reductions in the first diagnoses of common mental health disorders by 50%. They also found reductions in first diagnosis of type 2 diabetes by nearly 50%, of circulatory diseases by just over 40%, and of malignant cancers by 16%. So there's a general impact on how health services are working at the moment. And I just want to draw your attention to this study at the bottom by Chen and colleagues. This was led by Rudolf Cardinal, who will be presenting within this series, I think in, in November or so, I can't remember precisely when, yeah, 10th of November. Um, and, and Rudolf and team have studied the impact of the pandemic on mental health service provision and demand across Cambridge and Peterborough. And I think that'll be well worth looking at because they've done some real deep digging there into the records and have some very fascinating findings. So, I mean, I don't think there's much more to say except that uh, one thing is clear, there's been a major change in the use of healthcare services across the period of the pandemic, and it's likely that there will be ripples for some time to come. But I'm sure Rudolph will have plenty more to say about that. So now let's move on to effects of the context, the lockdown and everything on the general population. And this is really the, the last part. So I've already alluded to these, this study by Luo and colleagues in which they uh, looked at a mixture of people who'd had infection and those who hadn't and, and did a meta-analysis. There's an overlapping study uh, using some of the same data by Xiong and others, and they um, reviewed studies that looked just at the general population over the same time period. This is data up until May of this year. And they found variable um, prevalence of a set of disorders and, and really quite marked variation, but nonetheless, uh, 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 you know, an appreciable prevalence of all of these conditions. So anxiety varying between six and 50%, depression from 15 to 48, uh, PTSD from 7 to 54%, depending on the studies this is, and stress from 8 to 82%. Um, you know, obviously those are huge, a huge amount of noise in that, and it probably depends upon the scales and natural variation. But 
again, what we're finding is that there is an appreciable prevalence and that there are these replicable risk factors. Females, younger people, usually less than 40 years, presence of chronic physical or psychiatric illness, social stresses like unemployment, all predisposed to uh, people suffering these psychological consequences of the lockdown situation. Um, Solomon and Constantinidou uh, looked in, I think, Cyprus between the uh, 3rd and 9th of April, they surveyed just over 1,500 people with, again, quality of life, GAD7, PHQ9, so all of the, the usual um, disclaimers. But they found, again, appreciable prevalence of anxiety, both mild and moderate, and of depression. Again, it was worse in women, in younger people, in unemployed, in those with a history of psychiatric illness. Really strong pattern emerging. And then work that I, I don't want to go into because this is, uh, I, well, it may be covered by Tamsin Ford, who again is giving, we're very lucky, giving a talk in this series on the 27th of October. But the, the really good thing about this study is that it again capitalised on this UK household longitudinal study. But it capitalised on the fact that there's the possibility of having longitudinal data. So they actually had data from almost, well, 17 and a half thousand people who'd had date, um, similar questionnaires from prior to the lockdown. And what they found was that as a whole, the GHQ 12 score, this measure of depression, had increased. Uh, the average in April was 12.6, whereas the same time last year it was 11.5, the year before it was 11.5, so it had gone up significantly. And 27 people, 27 percent of people were above the the cutoff for clinical significance. And again, that compares to 18 or 19 percent in previous uh, years. They looked at these within individual increases in scores, and they found that if you're younger you had uh, a significantly greater score for depression. If you were a woman, if you had young children, if you were, um, I think that should say unemployed, or maybe it wasn't, I, just ignore that for now, I might have got that wrong. But being female, uh, having young children, being younger was meant that you're really bearing the brunt of this change and showing appreciable increases in your depression scores. And then finally, just thinking about the population as a whole, there's a very nice, um, resource uh, at UCL where they've got a sort of rolling updated online study called the COVID social study um, and you can inquire of that every week they update it every week and look at what's happening to the general patterns and I've done that from the most recent output and this is what depression and anxiety are doing across the general population again measuring these phenomena with the PHQ-9 for the depression and the GAD7 for anxiety, so all the usual problems with that, but nonetheless it's interesting. So if you look at depression from March until 28th September, which is our last measure, you can see um, that compared to, uh, I've drawn a couple of blue lines which are for men and women uh, population norm scores that we might expect, so slightly higher for women than men. So you can see how much higher the, the blue line for the current situation is compared to um, what we might expect for the population norm. And similarly for anxiety, I've drawn the population norm lines uh, in red dotted lines. So again, the anxiety scores are much greater than we would predict in the context of the uh, pandemic. And if you want to break it down according to a variety of factors, you can do that. So the depression scores are worse in younger people. They're worse in people um, who are living alone. They're worse in people who don't have as great a household income. And they're much worse in people who have a history of psychiatric illness. And a pretty similar pattern for anxiety. It's worse to be young, to be, well, living alone doesn't seem to make a difference here, but household income and, of course, uh, psychiatric history makes a difference. So to summarise that, I mean, that's a, there's a huge amount of research and I, I, I don't really have time to go into it, but leaving aside the direct effects of infection, the situation as a whole is associated with higher scores 
um, in a substantial pro proportion of people. Um, and many of them are reaching above these clinical cutoff scores for anxiety and depression. Admittedly, there's only one longitudinal study, and maybe Tamsin will cover that in her talk. Um, but again, you know, we have to be careful. We have the use of these scales where scores can be inflated beyond the clinical cutoff point by experiences that are in the current climate potentially ambiguous. I, I think this is really important. Um, the PHQ-9 asks you questions about how you've been over the last two weeks, and you rate a series of symptoms from naught meaning not at all to three meaning nearly every day. And you just have to score five to be considered mildly uh, depressed. And if basically you're sleeping too much or too little, you feel tired, uh, you have a poor appetite, or you're overeating, or you have trouble concentrating. And that just happens on a couple of days during the last two weeks, then you would score as being clinically anxious. Um, similarly for the GAD7, it uses a similar scoring system. And if you're nervous or anxious, worried, uh, have trouble relaxing, easily annoyed or irritable, afraid something awful might happen, again, you're scoring at a clinical level for anxiety. Sorry, the, the first one was for depression. Um, now that's as maybe, you know, nobody says these are, these are perfect scales, but I, I, I think it's worth bearing that in mind when we start to draw general conclusions about mental illness in the, in the population. So to summarize, um, and you know, I'd hoped when I embarked on this that I could do you all a favor, review the literature nice and neatly and present you with a series of findings and then that would save you having to do any work yourself. But as you've seen, it's a messy uh, and it's an emerging and an evolving literature. I think there are some things we can say with confidence. I think acute infection with the virus is accompanied by a set of neuropsychiatric features um, and complications that are suggestive potentially of direct effects on the nervous system function and the extent to which these features are caused by infective processes, immune responses, neurological changes, treatment effects even, is very hard to disentangle. But nevertheless, there is a, a clear syndrome of experience that uh, goes with COVID that manifests in classically psychiatric symptoms, anxiety, uh, depressed mood, insomnia, potentially confusion. Um, now, that ambiguity is not surprising. I, I think as anyone who spent any time in a clinical setting knows, there are inextricable links between physical and mental processes and therefore between physical and mental illness. And COVID-19 is not unique in featuring psychiatric symptoms, nor is it unique in that it seems that those with pre-existing psychiatric illness are more vulnerable to its effects. The other point is that recovery itself even when you're testing negative for the, um, for the virus, is very variable. There are persistent lingering psychiatric symptoms, notably anxiety and depression, as well potentially as PTSD, cognitive changes and so forth. And once again, the extent to which this is specific to COVID-19 is not yet clear, I, I, I think. Um, given the evidence that infections, physical ill health generally are strongly predisposing to mental illness. But it does seem, I think, that this is especially pronounced in COVID-19 based on the evidence we have so far. Whether this is a consequence of some unique mechanism, something special about this virus, or whether it's a more general mechanism that this virus is enacting with greater um, severity, I, I think is yet to be discovered. And I, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see the emerging patterns out of work such as David Menon is doing, looking into brain changes with COVID. Um, I think when we broaden the focus, so that, that's um, essentially what we find in people who suffered from the uh, infection. When we broaden the focus to the general population, we're definitely seeing appreciable increases in self-rated anxiety and depression. And those who are bearing the brunt of this are largely younger people, females, people who are isolated, people who are less well off, people who lack support, and people who already um, suffer psychiatric problems. 
But balanced against that is this, I, I think this need for care. Um, just as the online measures to assess anxiety and depression in the inpatient population are complicated by the presence of acute illness, I think the attempt to scrutinize so-called mental health and, and therefore by implication mental illness in this extremely uh, abnormal situation is also dogged by the same conceptual, philosophical um, and practical problems. And, and one of the problems that I foresee as we survey the impact, both direct and indirect of COVID-19 on mental illness, lies in the use of these general survey tools um, that center the problem essentially at the individual level. Um, don't get me wrong, I believe that mental illness can exist at the individual level, um, in, in, in essence, separable from sociocultural um, factors. But in this instance, I think when we talk about the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, as assessing mental health, it's very important to recognize that a healthy response to a bizarre and unpleasant situation will cause us to score higher on these scales, indubitably. Um, put simply, the presence of a human stress response may be deemed abnormal or unhealthy only by appealing to the context. And as all clinicians know, the core of diagnosis or formulation involves a consideration of whether a person's experiences and symptoms are beyond what one might expect given the situation. It's, so it seems to me um, problematic to be applying screening tools to the general population and interpreting the findings purely in the language of psychiatry and clinical psychology, because it, it may not be the most apposite. Um, even when it's been carefully softened and toned down by the gentle euphemisms that we now see in the paper. So people talk about mental health issues or mental health challenges. I think even then there's a danger that we are entering a territory that, that may, um, may prove to be quite difficult to navigate. And it's very important when thinking about these scales that we think about the situation or the context in which the measurements are occurring. So on that note, I've gone on for just over my 40 minutes. So I'll end there and be happy to um, enter the discussion. So thank you, Paul, for that really interesting talk and a really great introduction into the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. Don't forget to join us next week when we will welcome Professor David Menon, and he will be discussing their recent work on neurocovid, epidemiology, biomarkers and pathophysiology. Sign up for this talk and all of the rest in the series at the links shown here. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on Twitter at Cam Neuro to keep up to date with everything that's happening at Cambridge Neuroscience and see you next week. <laughs>